Hind's Feet on High Places, Chapter 16, Grave on the Mountains. The path led forward to the edge of a yawning chasm, then stopped dead. This grave-like gorge yawned before them in each direction, as far as they could see, completely cutting off all further progress. It was so filled with cloud and mist that they could not see how deep it was, nor could they see across to the other side, but spread before them like a great gaping grave, waiting to swallow them up. For a moment, Much Afraid wondered whether this could be the place after all, but as they halted on the edge of the canyon, they could plainly hear the sound of mighty, swirling waters, and she realized that they must be standing somewhere near the lip of the great fall, and that this was indeed the place appointed. Looking at her companions, she asked quietly, "'What must we do now? Can we jump across to the other side?' No, they said, it would be impossible. What then are we to do? she asked. We must leap down into the canyon, was the answer. Of course, said Much Afraid at once. I did not realize at first, but that this is the thing to do. Then for the last time on that journey, though she did not know it at the time, she held out her hand to her two companions that they might help her. By this time she was so weak and exhausted that instead of taking her hands, they came close up to her and put their hands beneath her arms so that she leaned with her full weight against them. Thus, with suffering and sorrow supporting her, much afraid cast herself down into the yawning grave. The place into which they had thrown themselves was deep, and had she been alone she must have been badly hurt by the fall. However, her companions were so strong that the jump did not seem to harm them at all, and they bore her so easily between them and broke the fall so gently that she was no more than bruised and shaken. Then, because the canyon was so filled with mist and cloud that nothing was visible, they began to feel their way slowly forward and saw, looming up before them, a flat, oblong rock." On reaching it, they found it to be some kind of stone altar with the indistinct figure of someone standing behind it. This is the place, said Much Afraid quietly. This is where I am to make my offering. She went up to the altar and knelt down. My Lord, she said softly through the mist, will you come to me now and help me to make my burnt offering as you have commanded me? But for the first time on all that journey, there seemed to be no answer, no answer at all, and the shepherd did not come. She knelt there quite alone in the cold, clammy mist, beside the desolate altar in this valley of shadow, and into her mind came the words which bitterness had flung at her long before, when she walked the shores of loneliness. Sooner or later, when he gets you up on the wild places of the mountains, he will put you on some sort of a cross and abandon you to it. It seemed that, in a way, bitterness had been right, thought much afraid to herself, only he had been too ignorant to know, and she too foolish at that time to understand that in all the world only one thing really mattered, to do the will of the one she followed and loved no matter what it involved or cost. Strangely enough, as she knelt there by the altar, seemingly abandoned at that last tremendous crisis, there was no sign or sound of the presence of her enemies. The grave up on the mountains is at the very edge of the high places and beyond the reach of pride and bitterness and resentment and self-pity, yes, and of fear, too, as though she were in another world altogether, for they had never cast themselves down into that grave. She knelt there, feeling neither despair nor hope. She knew now, without a shadow of a doubt, that there would be no angel to call from heaven to say that the sacrifice need not be made, and this knowledge caused her neither dread nor shrinking." She felt nothing but a great stillness in which only one desire remained, to do that which he had told her, simply because he had asked it of her. 
The cold, dull desolation which had filled her heart in the cave was gone completely. One flame burned there steadily, the flame of concentrated desire to do his will. Everything else had died down and fallen into ashes. After she had waited for a little, and still he had not come, she put out her hand and with one final effort of failing strength grasped the natural human love and desire growing in her heart and struggled to tear them out. At the first touch it was as though anguish pierced through her every nerve and fiber, and she knew with a pang almost of despair that the roots had wound and twined and thrust themselves into every part of her being. Though she put forth all her remaining strength in the most desperate effort to wrench them out, not a single rootlet stirred. For the first time she felt something akin to fear and panic. She was not able to do this thing which she had asked of her. Having reached the altar at last, she was powerless to obey, turning to those who had been her guides and, her and helpers all the way up the mountains. She asked for their help and for them to do what she could not for herself to tear the plant out of her heart. For the first time, suffering and sorrow shook their heads. We have done all that we can do for you, they answered, but this we cannot do. At that, the indistinct figure behind the altar stepped forward and said quietly, I am the priest of this altar. I will take it out of your heart if you wish. Much afraid turned toward him instantly. Oh, thank you, she said. I beg you to do so. He came and stood beside her, his form indistinct and blurred by the mist, and then she continued entreatingly, I am a very great coward. I am afraid that the pain may cause me to try to resist you. Will you bind me to the altar in some way so that I cannot move? I would not like to be found struggling while the will of my Lord is done. There was complete silence in the cloud-filled canyon for a moment or two. Then the priest answered, It is well said. I will bind you to the altar. Then he bound her hand and foot. When he had finished, Much Afraid lifted her face toward the high places, which were quite invisible, and spoke quietly through the mist. My Lord, behold me, here I am, in the place thou didst send me to, doing the thing thou didst tell me to do, for where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Ruth one seventeen. Still there was a silence, a silence as of the grave, for indeed she was in the grave of her own hopes, and still without the promised hind's feet, still outside the high places with even the promise to be laid down on the altar. This was the place to which the long, heartbreaking journey had led her. Yet just once more before she laid it down on the altar, much afraid repeated the glorious promise which had been the cause of her starting for the high places. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds' feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. To the chief singer on my stringed instruments, Habakkuk 3, verse 19. The priest put forth a hand of steel right into her heart. There was a sound of rending and tearing, and the human love, with all its myriad rootlets and fibers, came forth. He held it for a moment and then said, Yes, it was ripe for removal. The time had come. There is not a rootlet torn or missing. When he had said this, he cast it down on the altar and spread his hands above it. There came a flash of fire which seemed to rend the altar. After that, nothing but ashes remained, either of the love itself, which had been so deeply planted in her heart, or of the suffering and sorrow which had been her companions on that long, strange journey. 
A sense of utter, overwhelming rest and peace engulfed much afraid. At last, the offering had been made, and there was nothing left to be done. When the priest had unbound her, she leaned forward over the ashes on the altar and said with complete thanksgiving, It is finished. Then, utterly exhausted, she fell asleep. <laughs>